Greetings to, to everyone. Uh, my name is Gabi Ngobo. I am the Curatorial Director at the Javed Art Center at the University of Pretoria, shortly known as the Javed UP. Um, it is my pleasure for us as a Javed UP to be co-hosting um, uh, this webinar, which is titled The Question of Africanness and the Expanded Field of Sculpture, Part Two, featuring presentations by Melvin Edwards, uh, Curly R. R. Halton, and moderated by Prof. George Smith. Um, I will be introducing all the panelists um, as soon as I uh, speak a little bit about what uh, the Javed Art Center is. The Javed Art Center is a partnership between the University of Pretoria and the Javed Foundation. Um, we all believe in the potential of art in society and its emancip emancipatory uh, nature. And uh, we do this through multidisciplinary curatorial and pedagogic initiatives. Um, the Javed UP is a project that is, that is, um, that, that has one foot firmly rooted in academia and the other one embedded in the public. Our role is to critically respond to histories of Africa's creative outputs and the future aspirations of the continent and the diaspora. Central to our commitment um, is a continuous decolonial dialogue that responds to the present whilst considering the historical and the future implications of our political and social actions. Javed UP is committed to, to sustained critical inquiries where activities of writers, artists, researchers, advocacy groups, historians, politicians, farmers, scientists, musicians, et cetera, can, be, can, can intersect. The Javed UP, has a feature, which is our bridge gallery, which is a symbolic architectural feature connecting the university and its surrounding communities. This bridge gallery ensures also easy access to all members of the university community. We position ourselves as a living school and an institution committed to creating spaces of unexpected learning together with our publics. We employ long-term pedagogical processes that we hope to nature a space for transformative processes to take shape through curiosity, discovery, and possibility. Our programs embrace fluidity and experimentation, creating spaces for like co collective learning and unlearning processes to take shape. We are committed to promoting experimental thinking about the relationship between art and society. Through our multidisciplinary non-hierarchical collective learning and mediation initiatives, we desire to promote spaces for non-bureaucratized artistic and pedagogical investigations. Our initiatives are led by questions rather than answers. They are self-reflective rather than illustrative. Um, we are committed to cultivating contact zones with schools, individuals, social and advocacy groups and hybrid institutions surrounding Tswane and beyond. This webinar is presented and hosted by us here at the Javed UP, the African Center for Study of United States at University of Pretoria, the Institute for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts, the African Center for the Study of the United States at the University of Vetswatersrand. Our panelists today uh, include the sculptor, um, uh, Melvin Edwards, who is a, a pioneer in the history of contemporary African-American art and sculpture. Melvin was born in Houston, Texas, he began his artistic career at University of South California, USC, Los Angeles, where he was mentored by the Hungarian painter, Francis de Elderly. In 1965, 
the Santa Barbara Museum of Art organized his, solo, his first solo exhibition. Edwards then moved to New York, New York City in 1967. Shortly after his arrival in the city, his work was exhibited at the Studio Museum in Harlem. In 1970, he became the first African-American sculptor to have a solo exhibition at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Edwards received an honorary doctorate from IDSVA. Collie R. R. Halton has been executive director of the David C. Driscoll Center and artist in residence at the Department of Arts at the University of Maryland since 2012. The David M. and Linda Roth Professor of Art Emeritus at, at Lafayette College Eastern PA. Halton is a printmaker and painter whose work has been exhibited in prestigious national and international venues, such as Egypt's Seventh International Biennale uh, in Cairo, the Cleveland Museum of Art, and the Whitney Museum of American Art. His work is in many private and public collections. Halton received an honorary doctorate from IDSVA in 2018. And uh, lastly, but not least, our moderator, George Smith, uh, who is a founder and president of IDSVA, and Edgar E. Kunz, Jr., professor of new philosophy. He is the author of The Artist Philosopher and New Philosophy from 2018. The Artist Philosopher and Poetic, um, Hemarne, sorry, uh, The Artist Philosopher and Poetic Hermeneutics uh, from 2021 and the artist philosopher in the age of addiction, Heidegger's climatology, which is forthcoming. It is my pleasure to, to welcome you to this webinar um, and as said to host it as part of the Javed UP's ongoing programs of, of collaboration. Uh, I would like to hand over to the moderator, George Smith, over to you. Yes, uh, Gabby, thank you so much. And uh, really wonderful ha to have you with us today. As everybody probably knows uh, that's joining us this morning, Gabby is surely a great promise of the future of curatorial art forms in the world today. And we're honored to be part of your presence today, Gabby. Thanks so much. And hi, everybody else, it's good to see Curly and good to see the other trouble maker that's joining me this morning, Mel Edwards, certainly one of the great uh, sculptural figures in <coughs> American art, but also obviously a great contributor to the history of art and sculpture in the world today. And Curly, again, uh, one of the major contributors to the future of visual arts and cultural consciousness. Uh, and we're very grateful to have you both with us. I, I uh, feel absolutely, uh, uh, intimidated to be in the presence of these uh, great giants. And I, I, I think that the best thing I can do is pretty much stay the hell out of the way and let uh, Curly and, 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 and Mel uh, have at it. They're all cronies, so I'm sure they'll have a couple of really good uh, disagreements. Uh, but I wanna start with, with one or two things that kind of pays a little bit of attention to our title, which is, has to do with Africanness and, uh, and the uh, the expanded field of sculpture. And it, it does seem to me that, that uh, when we, we uh, joined in on the first uh, round of that with Olu Aguibé and, and uh, uh, Johan Tan, the assumption was that the expanded field was something you know, recent. But in fact, uh, what we know is that that's not the case at all. The uh, field of sculpture has been expanding forever. And what I would say is that, that uh, Mel Edwards is very much instrumental in one of the major phases of that uh, field expansion here in the United States, but ob obviously affecting the world at large in that respect. And of course, uh, Curly Holton is very much a participant in, in that historical unfolding, not least uh, by way of his commissioning Mel to design the uh, David C. Driscoll Memorial that will be placed in front of the uh, David C. Driscoll Center. 
one is completed. So, uh, Mel, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you see your place in that historical unfolding of an ever expanding field. And then Curly, maybe you could say a word or two about how uh, that that whole dynamic comes into play with regard to your your participation in Mel's uh, sculptural life as the director of the Driscoll Center. So Mel, uh, really great to see you this morning and I'm so glad you're with us. Can't hear you, Mel. Can't hear you, Mel. Good afternoon as you are there. Um, and um, just very good to see everybody and to be hooked up this way. Um, around the world. It, it reminds me of uh, a question I was asked a few years ago and it often gets thrown around uh, in the US and it's called the Black Arts Movement. And I was asked, you know, my part in that or whatever. And I said, well, you know, first of all, uh, you really have to put, take the word black away for a moment and put the word African first. And then when, once you understand uh, deeply the, the meaning, uh, the Black Arts Movement was not something that started recently because it is African art in its absolute uh, furthest extension back in human history. It was there and people made it. It didn't have to be labeled uh, this or that. As so many of the things that we label, we have reasons for labeling things because Hopefully, um, uh, it will make things positively functional. It doesn't always work out that way in terms of how things are received, but that is just a reality. The art never, uh, we can't know a human time when art didn't exist in relation to human beings. And it's always been produced by all people on the planet uh, from the beginning. So there's nothing actually new about it. There are always renewals in relation to the circumstances in various places. Uh, you know, some of them good, some of them not so good, but that's just a human reality. So I'm basically just a, a young man uh, uh, who's a child of his parents and who got encouraged uh, in relation to art. And then uh, I went with it where I could. And sometimes doors opened and sometimes doors were closed. And in a variety of ways, those things happen to everybody. I'm, in that respect, I'm not uh, unique. And, you know, it's like we all have a personal life and we all have the life where uh, we're automatically related to everybody else's uh, realities. In other words, Einstein's relativity is a, a human reality as much as a conceptual one in physics and uh, those things. So anyway, I could run on. Uh, you know, an old professor uh, and an ongoing uh, uh, blah blah. So next, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, maybe you could just before we jump over to Curly, uh, maybe Mel, you could say a word about uh, your own uh, your own making, uh, which is uh, maybe you are not in, in and of yourself unique, but certainly your making uh, is of a, of, a, of a stylistic distinction that that brings you to the attention of the world and certainly does uh, relegate you to a place in the history of art and the history of sculpture. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that how that style. Uh, comes into development over time. You know, clearly uh, you're dealing with what I describe as the uh, uh, detritus or detritus of, of the uh, uh, military industrial complex, which is a, a generally a Western and white uh, complex. How uh, you're able to, you know, gather up those remnants and, and convert them into things of beauty that are themselves deeply historical in their reverberations of the process that they're put through to give us the art that you present to us. Where or why, but I understood that art could be made of any material and about any subject and that one could experiment uh, not knowing where one was going 
and find things. In other words, discovery was a part of it. Um, and um, uh, people talked about and labeled, uh, say, found art, found objects in art and stuff like that. Well, if you find it, something created it, you know. Um, I was once in uh, uh, Zimbabwe and uh, uh, had shown photographs of some of my very large scale uh, public sculpture, which were made of stainless steel and were compositions that were apparently uh, geometric primarily. However, uh, I was showing them to a, a couple of people involved in industry um, in, um, in Zimbabwe. And the man said, you know, he said, in that one sculpture, you have more stainless steel than we have in all of Zimbabwe, you know? <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, we laughed, but uh, what I did know was that the uh, alloys that allowed stainless steel to be created in the world significantly came from Zimbabwe, you know? And so everything in the world interrelates in some kind of way. It doesn't matter what. And um, uh, they were people who were not happy with the uh, independence of Zimbabwe. And I, of course, was very happy with the independence of Zimbabwe. And um, you always have uh, opposing ideas about how to work. Uh, things are labeled and called styles. And it's as if you had to work within the parameters of the, uh, that style. And, uh, for me, it didn't matter. First of all, I became a sculptor while I was stopping being a painter, and much of my education uh, was more focused uh, in art on painting. And uh, I just sort of received a batch of photographs of about uh, 12 or 13 of the abstract paintings I was doing in the early 60s as I embarked on the first experiments uh, in sculpture. And uh, I can see the interrelationships, but I doubt if many people can. And it's because what you do visually and what you're doing with your thought processes may not be easily apparent to others, but you know, it's, it's like improvisation in music. You know, there's music that's written out and is uh, excellent. And then there's uh, the great improvisers in music, you know, and uh, the, the difference in a symphonic production and a Charlie Parker quartet uh, and the dynamics is the excellence is there in either case, but the time between thinking and getting the work out in that music called jazz is instantaneous whereas a symphonic composition uh, has to be written out and then uh, transcribed, presented for a bunch of musicians, and then it's done. In other words, it's a larger, more complicated work process. So is the difference between small sculpture and large scale public sculpture. And I could go on and on about this and ramble, um, um, you know, about these things, but they are the dynamics that we encounter. And one of the most important people that I've encountered in my 50 years or more of being involved in modern art and development, and as relates to the United States and Africa, is encountering a man named Demas Nwoko, who's a architect, artist, in Nigeria and who I met in 1970. And we've been in contact ever since. Uh, and he's just um, uh, produced a book of his thinking and thoughts. He developed a concept called new culture. And he was right at the age where as Nigeria was getting its independence, uh, he and other younger uh, uh, creative people felt that they had to develop something that was authentic, unique, and inventive. And he did, and for years he's done that. Uh, but instead of going and 
having a major place in Europe, he stayed in Nigeria. That was the intent so that the contribu contributions and developments were there where they have ancient history, recent history, and the future. And he uh, understood that all of those components are what we work with. And I've worked enough with him and we still call because <laughs> these days you can do that like we're doing this. Uh, and it's very, uh, uh, it's very good to see the possibilities expand. Thank you, George. I, I, I'll keep talking and, and I don't know where I started. So yeah, for those of you who don't know Mel, he's the one person in the world that, that says a sentence that never has a period to it. <laughs> uh, Curly, great to see you there. And, and uh, I, again, I feel so blessed to be in the company of you two guys together in one place. We've done that once before, I know. I, I, uh, I would like to mention, Curly, and maybe you could say more about this, that the Driscoll Center is the Driscoll Center for the Study of African American, African Americans, African American Art, and the African American, the African Diaspora. So maybe you could say a little bit more about the Driscoll Center that you've done so much to bring to where it is today. And then maybe we can talk a little bit about how that development wound up uh, putting uh, Mel Edwards in your company to discuss the possibility of a memorial for David Driscoll. And maybe you'd be so kind as to say a few words about David, because obviously that's very much a part of, of what we're talking about today. Absolutely. Can you hear me OK? Yes, maybe you can turn the volume up a little bit. Is that a little better? Yeah. OK, great. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to be here and I think, uh, thank you, George, for inviting me and of course the host the institution is hosting this and the, the explanation of their institution and mission is really fantastic. I can very much, uh, I got a little block here. I don't know what that is. Okay, can you still, everything okay? Yeah, I had a little icon come up. But anyway, I, before I talk about mail and I really want to get to mail because mail is very modest. I want to pull him out a little bit there, but uh, the Driscoll Center was established in 2001 and it was established to honor David Driscoll and his major achievements as an artist, as a scholar, and as a historian. And he had put together a, a critical exhibition, uh, 200 Years of Black American Arts, 1750 to 1950, that was shown in Los Angeles to rave reviews. But what's also very important about his career and others that predated him like Charles, uh, you know, Romare Bearden, uh, James Porter, Elaine Locke, is that David was grounded in telling the story of the African-American cultural experience, especially from the perspective of the visual arts. At a time when that work and that practice and that study and that scholarship was for the most part dismissed and disregarded. So David was uh, doing the real important work the good work. He was keeping that record alive. He was doing that research. And he was arguing that this material was relevant. Even when he did the two centuries in 1976 at the Bicentennial, there was still criticism and dismissal of his scholarship and of his work. And that really in many ways represent the struggle that not only David had, but African-Americans have had culturally, especially the academics and the scholars, and arguing that the work and what they produced and how they thought, how they felt and how they interpreted the world was relevant and important. And again, that gets to that issue of objective and subjective, who has a power to define what something is, what the reality is and what the worth is. And of course, in the African-American experience, the African-American was always objectified, told what his name was, told what his meaning was, told what his reality was. So this notion that he could create something or she could create something and had validity and value was revolutionary. But that was the trajectory that David Driscoll was on and the Driscoll Center had tried to celebrate that legacy and advance that legacy. And David was so committed to this mission. But in addition to that, his, his scholarship, his achievement as an artist, he was excellent philosopher also. He loved philosophy, studied philosophy. And you know, sometimes he would surprise you because he would take a turn. He was also sort of influenced by his father who was a, uh, a Baptist minister and a uh, sharecropper. So David very much was impacted by his life as a young man and his desire to prove the worth of his family. 
He was never apologetic about his family, never apologetic about being an African-American, never apologetic about his feelings and his thoughts and his intellectual ability, where African-Americans traditionally had been dismissed as having any merits in that regard. For example, Finney, the great uh, poet, Finney, who won the National Book Award for Poetry some years ago, had a line in one of her poems that described a young black slave boy who had no pockets. And the reason he had no pockets is because he owned nothing to put in the pockets. Why would a slave have any possessions? So you can understand what this meant. So David was suggesting that there were plenty of possessions that were there. The one's experience, one is interpretation of the world from their perspective. So that was David's great argument. And was a humanist in that regard. And that connects to Mel Edwards, who was also a humanist. You can listen to how he described his role as a sculptor in a very general, but very kind of broad way. He was one of uh, many players in this, this sort of story, in this narrative. He was a character in this narrative. He was contributing, others were contributing, but, they, but Mel was doing more than that. Mel was a student of history, not only his own family's history, but the history of African-Americans. And Mel has always incorporated that story, that narrative into his practice. I like to think of Bob Marley's song, the redemption song. He says in one of his lyrics, all I have is my redemption song. And that's what David was attempting to do, was to redeem the African-American from the legacy of enslavement. That's what Mel's work is about. Mel's work is a sort of pride and high regard for his history. And that history is wide and broad and not to be dismissed. He takes very little credit for being a part of this, but actually as a sculptor, he uses many tools to forge his great monumental works of art. But Mel Edwards is a tool himself. He's a tool of this legacy. He's a tool of this history. And on this ancestral voyage, he is a tool as well. And I've always thought about him in that regard. So I don't know if he agrees with me, but, <laughs> but he's a, he manifests this, this not only vision, but this journey as well. And I think that's very important about Mel and David's relationship. So Mel Edwards was the perfect artist to create a monumental piece celebrating the history and the legacy and transcendent nature of David Driscoll's work. I've been often asked, well, will it be a, 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 a realistic portrayal of David? I say, yes, it will be, but it won't look anything like it. You know, <laughs> so, it'll be monumental because David was monumental, his humanity. And George, you know the person because he was a good friend of yours as well. His spirit was monumental. It was transcendent. And this sculpture is also transcendent and monumental and will embrace the spirit of David, but also connects to the legacy of the African in the new world. And often this is referred to as an African's dream, still having a dream, the dream of the slave, the dream of the African is manifest in the world. So I think these things are all connected when this notion of Africanness and who defines Africanness, who labels it, who owns it, who titles it is a very important issue for me. Often when I look at works of art, I think about them in terms of what are the arguments that this artist is making? And what is this about in terms of their effort to redeem themselves from whatever dynamic it, that exists that, that inspired them to make this work of art? Whether it's philosophical, whether it's an aesthetic argument, it comes from a place of redemption. It is always about redemption. George, I can hear you. Did you hear me okay? How's that? Is that better? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you're, there you go. Thanks, Curly. You you uh, uh, gave us as much as I have come to expect from you, which is more than I deserve. <laughs> and yeah, what you say is so true, of course. And I, I know that you, uh, 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 Curly, have been. Um, uh, a guest at Pretoria, if I'm not mistaken. And, and maybe uh, from that perspective, uh, you could say a little bit about how you situate the Driscoll Center and your own thinking within this concept of the diaspora. In a way, you could almost go, we could almost go back to what Mel said about the elements in stainless steel uh, that, <laughs> that originate in places that one would not expect. Uh, 
But could you say a little bit about the diaspora from your standpoint with regard to what you've said about, about uh, David Driscoll, but also how you've tied that into Mel's work? Because I think all of this comes together in a way that is incredibly important and certainly ties into the work that Gabby's doing nowadays. And I wanna make sure that we, we pay attention to, to, to that future that in a way is, a, is an expanded field that begins with people like yourself and David Driscoll, Mel Edwards, so many others. What are you gonna say about that, Curly? Yeah, I think even when Gabby made the presentation about an institution, there were some key references that really connected to the mission of the Driscoll Center. So it's creating a home for artists, a home for scholars. But more importantly, what it is doing, it is presenting a story. It is telling the story. And the Driscoll Center is really committed to telling this story, telling our story. And then our story is not just the story of African-Americans, but how expansive that story is and how that reality has been imagined by African-American and African artists of the diaspora and how we can host that story at the Driscoll Center because if we can tell that story, we become the authors of that story. We become the evaluators of that story. We not only get to objectify it and say is, uh, what it, why is it significant and how it's significant, but we stay subjective as well. And I believe in a deeper sense of subjectivity. So it's <laughs> important to tell our story from our experience and our perspective without apology. And I think that is exactly what is going on, telling that story and facilitating the telling of the story. So we acquire works of art from artists, we present symposium panels, we are bringing the community to make selections from our collection to, for, you know, individuals that have no background in the arts other than the love of art mm -hmm. to come in and make choices from our collection. And then we host those ex that exhibition. We have one up now telling the story. Yeah. And we invited these 23 uh, individuals in as selectors. They go online, look at our collection, then pick works from the collection. And then they write letters to the artist, whether the artist is alive or deceased, in the tradition of David Driscoll, who was great about <laughs> writing letters. <laughs> so you wanted to embrace this ideal of the, the viewer could like a work of arts. Normally within our practice in the academy, we don't like to use the term like. We want to have a real critique, a real unpacking. And a real argument. But in this particular case, we embrace this notion that that untrained love of art, when they said they liked something, it embodies something very personal, a, a, a relevant reaction that we embrace, that normally we dismissed. So my point is, is that we are trying to broaden that dynamic and that conversation. David Driscoll was very much like that himself. I have yes. never met an individual who has mentored and empowered so many other individuals. I, I, I mean, it. I know a lot of important artists, a lot of real renowned artists, but I've never met anyone that had so empowered individuals, whether his students or mentees across the country. And I was having a conversation with Sam Gilliam, who we lost not too long ago, yeah. tragically, about, he was a little jealous of David Driscoll having this major retrospective. <laughs> And he, he was a little critical about David's work as an artist. Says, well, no, David, I mean, uh, Sam, they're not coming because of his art. They're coming because of him. <laughs> I said, there are droves of them around the country coming because every one of them knew David personally. Yeah. Yeah. I say, in your case, maybe they're not going to show up as many will show up. But, <laughs> but in David's case, he demonstrated such an affection, such a generosity. I witnessed it firsthand. I know Mel has witnessed it and I know you witnessed it. Yes, so yes. this idea of humanity and a person of color, giving it a platform, suggesting that it, it is also important and that it is a voice that needed to be heard and expressed and listened to. That is our message at the Risco Center. And that connects us. That connects us around the world. That message and that mission connects us. Because I think that's what we're doing. Yeah. We're attempting to decolonize our realities and to present a fuller story that tells yeah. our complete story as humans. That's back to Mel now, that complete yeah, story. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Curly, so beautifully said. And of course, uh, I want to just interject and say that, that uh, David was certainly a mentor to me. And uh, when I came up with this crazy idea of starting the Institute for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts, 
uh, the first person I went to was David Drissel because I knew he wouldn't say to me, you're crazy. <laughs> right. And you know what he did say to me was that, yes, you're right about this idea. And what we want to do is to make sure that it is an idea that, that, that cuts across all, all perspectives, all races, all nations. And in a way, uh, we've been able to do that, but only because David Driscoll pitched in from the very beginning, not only in terms of his spiritual leadership, but also in terms of his pocketbook. Uh, just, a, just a great guy in every respect. And, and Mel, I'm not sure you're aware of this, but David uh, served as our visiting faculty at Spinocchio Castle for our first year students for, for a decade. And uh, they always left that experience forever inspired in the terms that Curly was so eloquently describing. But Curly, the, the idea of, of you know, telling this narrative uh, in, in, in a perspective that is peculiar to, to a given uh, sector of American experience and world experience, I think is so imperative to our understanding of what's going on in the world today with regard to uh, missions such as the new Javits Center and what Gabby is doing and what Mel has been doing all along. It just so happens that we're sitting in the company of two great storytellers. One is, of course, Curly Holton, and the other one is the, the guy with the endless sentence, uh, uh, Mel Edwards. Uh, but you know, Mel, uh, I, I have never seen one of your works of art that did not tell an endless story. And in fact, I see your entire oeuvre as kind of a, a number of, of, of chapters in a great narrative. Some of those chapters are deeply poetic and others are historical but they all link together an overarching uh, aspiration toward a future that comes out of that past that you situate within Africa, within the origins of your own vision, but also within the origins of a, of a certain vision. And I would even say, you know, I was recently looking again at the Bill Buckley, uh, James Baldwin uh, debate at uh, Cambridge University. Sure. And, you know, I was amazed to see that what they were talking about was the American dream. You know, I had forgotten all about that, but of course, if there is an American dream, it joins the dream of the world. Uh, but to me, and Baldwin was so plain about that, if, if that dream still existed even back then, it existed within the African-American community. It had been totally despoiled by the, by the materialism of, of the uh, oppressive culture. So uh, Mel, can you talk a little bit about the story that one, uh, uh, sees in one of your works of art and maybe how that links together your entire uh, history as, as a, you know, a leading voice in, 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 in the world with regard to the meaningfulness of, of sculpture, which is itself a deeply um, spiritual mode of representation, right? No. Can't hear you. You'll have to unmute Mel. <laughs> Mel. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, you see my, my right hand is Dr. Diallo Toure. And, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Diallo. Technician. Yeah, well, but you know, um, it's interesting that um, people use the word storytelling in relation to my work, because I do talk a lot. But in relation to the sculpture itself, through the years, most of my ideas really are improvisations that are developed. Uh, and where I start and where the, what the work looks like uh, um, uh, in the end are often quite different. Um, and I've always had the confidence that I didn't need to know in front what I was doing, but that if I kept working at it, I would do something. And uh, uh, um, I kind of use a metaphor, which uh, um, sometimes I'm chided for using, but the difference between realism and abstraction. And I say the only thing you ever create that's real is a baby and, the, uh, and everything else that leads up to it is abstract until that's the reality. Yeah. Um, but conception, mental, conception, uh, philosophical, 
Well, those roll around are, are, are the, everybody's imagination, you know. Uh, there's a work of mine at the Driscoll Center that uh, I never would have expected that it would be there or any place. And it showed up in an exhibition of uh, paintings or drawings of uh, uh, portraits of other artists. And this was a painting that I had done, uh, a quick uh, watercolor tempera uh, painting of Benny Andrews, the painter. And Benny and I were good friends. And if you talked about artistic styles, we were as different from each other as midnight and, and high noon, uh, but we were good friends. And when I moved to New York, Benny was the first artist uh, that took enough interest in my work uh, to want to uh, trade me for work. And so I have a very nice Benny Andrews painting. And uh, he had one of uh, my Lynch fragments, uh, that group of uh, smaller works. And, uh, but the, the painting happened because we were working at a center that went out and did uh, demonstrations for elementary school children. Only time in my life I ever uh, consented to be a part of uh, that kind of, you know, interest in, in children. Uh, I like children, but I, I didn't, never wanted the idea of teaching them, uh, certainly not at that age. But anyway, um, the, I had some time and I had the materials that were there for the kids and Benny was sitting nearby. And so unbeknownst to him, I just did this quick uh, kind of drawing painting of him and stuff. And then he realized what I had done of, uh, a few minutes later, and he says, you're a sculptor. I didn't know you could paint. And I said, look, we all had, um, we all had full educations as artists, you know, in school. And hey, I took life drawing stuff into, you know, I can, I can do that. You know, that's not, not a big deal. Um, but what he didn't know also was uh, I had spent the first roughly five years uh, after basically leaving school painting and I was just really learning sculpture and teaching myself to be a sculptor, which probably accounts for uh, my free association in ways I developed the work itself. And it's, uh, it can go a variety of ways. Um, I don't know if I uh, answered whatever you asked me a few minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, I never expected you to answer what I'm asking you, no. <laughs> you, did, you, better be tell, you better tell me what you asked me because, uh, but yeah, you know, I, already, if I could comment, because Curly's uh, uh, discussion and information reminded me of so many things, and that combined with the fact that uh, this program uh, uh, initiates in South Africa, and I had a sculptor friend who was in exile all of his uh, adult life, basically, uh, in the New York area. And he's a sculptor that they do know in South Africa now, but he died uh, the day he got his uh, passport to be able to go back home after 25 years of exile. And that's uh, the sculptor Dumele Fini. And he was a dear friend. And we talked about art and sculpture and the meanings of, of things, uh, you know, and uh, uh, he, I got the word that he passed from another South African in exile, the poet, Keora Petsa Kosetsile, Willie Kosetsile, and uh, uh, who was a dear friend for many years and who I, I finally got to see at home in South Africa in, uh, I think it was 2016. Uh, and then when I saw he passed away, you know, was big picture in the New York Times and stuff. And I said, well, here's a man who with the difficulty of his reality uh, had uh, uh, escaped. And I literally say it that way from South Africa, because he told me the story of how he had to wade across the Limpopo uh, in a place where it was shallow enough to do that in the dark, avoiding the possibility of crocodiles or other 
you know, possibilities. And so um, uh, I made a sculpture uh, years later called Across the Limpopo, but it was based on the story that Willie gave of his uh, uh, escape to uh, out of South Africa. He became a great poet. Uh, and I, I saw him in Nigeria at Festac. I used to see him often uh, in New York. And uh, it just brings up a whole series of people who stayed creative, uh, who the repercussions of their efforts uh, benefits us all, you know, and will benefit the future. There was an anthropologist uh, at uh, when I taught at the University of Connecticut named Bernard Magubani or Ben Magubani, and he was an anthropologist, but we became friends. This is the uh, period 1970 to 71 and 2. And he had uh, uh, three daughters. I had daughters as well. You know, so one of them was a baby. Well, an exhibition of my work, which is in Massachusetts now, uh, public large, larger scale works. And they had a little talk that I was uh, made. And in the audience turned out to be uh, two of uh, Ben Magabani's daughters. And the one who was the baby is now a professor at uh, Boston University, you know. Right. And I had promised Ben that I said, we know when freedom comes, Ben, we're gonna celebrate and have a beer uh, in uh, South Africa. Well, Ben was still working in the US when things changed, but I had tea with his daughter in Cape Town. <laughs> so great. You know, That's so all great. I'm saying is life and what we do creatively in terms of art, these uh, stories are not the kind of linear stories of, of, of activities or he did this and made somebody famous, but they're that we're all human and are dealing with human realities and how we and the human beings uh, that we're a part of overcome, if not individually, generationally, and if not, again, uh, in one place, but really all over the planet, you know. And um, Portland, Maine, I played football game in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> Long time ago, but what I'm just getting at is uh, uh, not only can you find connections that are close and make a uh, very good sense in artistic or uh, critical terms, but that creativity comes from all aspects of our experiences. And you get something from everywhere. And the more you go, as far as I'm concerned, it just informs you. You can't learn all the languages because you don't spend enough time with them, but you get something of the <clears throat> qualities of the human beings uh, because you encounter them. You don't always get it right, but usually you get something. And I think this uh, program today coming together, uh, uh, just again, um, uh, corroborates the effort. And that's important. I don't, so I don't know if I ever told you what story goes with, with what in relation to the work, because frankly, for me, every piece is a new experiment. Sure. You know, and sure. how much planning in advance? Well, they evolve and things often get changed so that where I started to go and where I end up um, are uh, not at all the same place, but it's not important that I do what I started out to do as it is that uh, I completed something that's somehow functional where it will live. Yeah, I, I would say that your sculpture uh, uh, operates the same way your storytelling does, though, you Mel, know, insofar as you start out telling one story and you wind up in Portland, Maine. <laughs> <laughs> well, George, I think, George, your question to Mel and Mel's uh, answer really touches on an important subject. 
for me is, is the motivation to practice, what choices we make as mm -hmm. artists and as scholars. Yep. Having a certain amount of ability, talent, and skill, making those particular choices about our practice. I was in, in Oaxaca, Mexico, and I was at lunch with uh, uh, Francisco Toledo, and we mm -hmm. were talking, and he doesn't talk much. He could teach, speak both English, Spanish, and French, but he, he was <laughs> uh, not very tolerant and very patient with Americans that didn't speak Spanish, so I was struggling with it. And he finally asked me what was my project. And I says, well, you know, I'm in Oaxaca, Mexico, looking at some traditional work. I came here to look at Rufino Tamayo's work. He said, no, what is your project? What he was talking about was my project as an artist. Yeah. And that has always stayed with me. And that is a very important question because there's so much art in this world, so many practitioners and the powers of the art world, me and, me and Mel have often talked about the canon and what that can means. But what that individual artist chooses to do with his talent and his work and his vision and strategies, that choice of practice to me is the most critical choice, regardless of the marketplace. And one thing that we do suffer, especially as people of color in this post-colonial world we live in, is those kind of colonial and capitalistic imperialistic powers still ask us to perform out our identity in public. Right. The most successful and popular African-American artists are artists that are still perpetuating what I think is a Harlem Renaissance kind of new Negro-ness. Yes. Painting our world, painting ourselves and presenting it to the public as if it's, a, it's still exotic and still a mystery to the world. Right. To me, it just, it's diminishing to me. It's suggesting right. that we don't have any <laughs> right. No genius, no vision, only the presenta presentation of our bodies in a public space for consumption. Yeah. So this is happening all over the world. You see it in Africa, you see it in the West. The marketplace is still interested in this exotic, erotic portrayal of the Black yeah. figure and the Black body. That yeah. has to stop. We have yeah. to demand that other things are considered. Our intellectual life is considered. Our vision, our creativity is considered just not the perpetuation of our bodies to be consumed by the marketplace. Yeah, I, I wish I could say it as well as you do, uh, Curly. I'm right with you on that 100%. And of course, it's just another form of appropriation, right? Absolutely. And, and uh, to me, emancipation is uh, to get over, to get around, to get through that, to really have an identity that's not dependent on responding to the expectation of what that identity is. And, and again, coming back to Mel's work, obviously <laughs> Mel was not paying a lot of attention to those expectations. He went off right. ahead and, and, and you know, made great art according to what his muses right. were telling him to make rather than what the market was demanding of them. Yeah. And I, I think again, Mel, that brings me back to this notion of jazz that you were talking about before, because of course, there's a great deal of difference between jazz and, and, and uh, you know, the classical canon uh, and those, those differences come down to what you were describing. Uh, but nonetheless, just as with the classical canon, uh, uh, Mozart, for instance, when you're done with that, with that uh, piano concerto, you know that you've heard a story. And when you're listening to Art Tatum, when he's done, you know that you're listening to a story. You know, it's the un unfolding of a, of a spiritual a journey or a passage that, that winds up at a, at, a, at a certain place temporarily before it goes on to the next place. And it seems to me that that's precisely what your work does, whereas a classical composition actually does respond to the, to the expectations of a canon, the Western canon, uh, the Western consciousness, Western identi identification, Western mathematics for that matter. Uh, what Mel, I think, does is, is purely spontaneous at least in relative terms to that, where the outcome is not, is not foregone. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what you're gonna wind up with with a Mozart, and I love Mozart, but nonetheless, you're gonna wind up with a beautifully articulated mathematical equation that all adds up. Uh, what I would say with your work, Mel, is, that, is a very different kind of narrative where even as you see one of your works for the, in, in the, in the instantaneous, instantaneous moment of perception, you really don't know where you're going. And in fact, what I would say about your work is every time I see one of your pieces, uh, it, it brings me to another part of the narrative that I hadn't seen before. Um, all of that narrative adds, to, adds up to, in my view, not the human, human genius that someone like Mozart would have, which, a, which is a, a conceptual genius, 
uh, but rather a genius that is unique to itself. It's, it's, you can call it an intuitive genius, George. An intuitive genius. Uh, and well, what I would say is it, it's not that it's lacking logic. In fact, what I'm thinking of as I'm saying this is something like what, what Heldelin, the great German poet, would call poetic logic, where in fact, there is an enormous amount of logic that, that informs, for me at least, Mel, your process. Uh, but nonetheless, it's still open to uh, not what you're trying to say, but what comes into you from outside, from the muse, call it whatever you want to, those ancient roots that, that compel you in ways that are almost unconscious to, to arrive at a place that you yourself have not yet anticipated. It, it's not a, your, your work is not a foregone conclusion when it begins. I feel embarrassed that I'm telling you what you do. So no, forgive no, no. me. Shut up. And ask uh, you to, to correct me. Uh, no, I'm not correcting you, but I'm just thinking of the variety of realizations that have come to me about myself in in my life. And when you mention the term logic, that always buzzes uh, uh, me when anybody uses a term, and it's a personal reaction and nobody would know why. I've confessed it a few times. The only class in my years in the university that I absolutely failed was a course in logic. <laughs> well, you know, had and you but, taken a- No, but wait, but, uh, <laughs> but um, I understood I just couldn't, was something was too dense or something. And I was a person who read a lot. And, and uh, so that wasn't the issue of, I just, the, the language and the way the structure of things were in the book, it was like mathematics. And then I realized, well, the only course I had absolute trouble with in high school was algebra. And it took me five semesters to get through three semesters of it. So, but what I'm getting at is what I, uh, through the years, I, I always liked reading philosophy, always liked ways uh, encountering things where people were discussing how they think or how life is thought. And uh, when you spoke of uh, Mozart, uh, and I think Charlie Parker, or uh, more modernly than Charlie Parker, though that's hard, say, and Ornette Coleman, you know, but various people do what turn jazz into what they call the new music uh, from roughly 1960 onward. But really, it was always just music. It was labeled structurally as people comprehended what was going on uh, from one period to another. And though the documentation for Western classical music is much more thorough and complete, the levels of evolution in the world's music, the music of China, the music of India, the musics of, you know, everywhere, it's all uh, um, equally dynamic, equally material for uh, further evolution, and human beings always do that. Um, one of the definitions, um, or expressions of a quasi definition for the word jazz is they say, well, uh, you know, uh, there's no such, you know, word. And it was asked of the poet Jane Cortez, who used those dynamics in music, sound, and, and language. And she said, well, jazz is just an African word for music. And immediately somebody responded, well, what African language is that in? She said, it's the African language of Africans in America. In other words, we did not stop evolving creatively or otherwise because we moved from one continent to another. And so in the uh, use of language, we've, there are a lot of other words that we don't dare use, which were invented. <laughs> uh, uh, but the point is, is that there, uh, ability to express human emotions or quality are valid, you know, and the validity or their use and function for human beings is absolute, you know, but at the same time, 
we have our, well, these words you don't use in uh, polite conversation or this or that, but at the same time, we know they're valuable in terms of expressing. And so it is with a uh, form and uh, uh, ideas in visual art. And visual art has the same extensive, uh, wide open future is what we do and what we perceive uh, uh, that those things could consist of. The argument between abstraction and realism, well, it, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a good drink at a bar, you know. You, you have a long conversation and you're still going to be in the vicinity at the end where you were when you started. It's just the glass will be empty. Yeah. <laughs> so which, which, which glass? Well, <laughs> I don't, because I don't remember <laughs> which glass you served me. I, <laughs> I'm just taking them one at a time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I think uh, uh, putting together programs like this, uh, no, that uh, uh, that should help to stimulate uh, uh, people understanding their connectedness, no matter how far. And of course, with the technology these days, uh, we can, you know, be much closer to each other, no matter how far we are actually in physical presence. Uh, but it also means that our ideas can intersect uh, much more rapidly. And hopefully uh, we or the generations that are coming will make really a positive use of what uh, evolved because the, the, certainly the last hundred years, uh, the quantity uh, of changes of possibility for human being is, it's literally like the atomic bomb. Uh, you know, the explosion of, of nuclear explosion of ideas, technology, and uh, human uh, understanding of how much we can expand. And we, we already thought we were complex, but the truth is uh, it's going to expand much more, you know, and it just, it makes sense. But uh, I'm, I'm having trouble enough dealing with what, <laughs> we've had to deal with and work here, you know, so I just think it's all good um, and I have no finality kind of uh, uh, comments in relation to it because anything that we say, you know, as we discussed today, uh, if we were or have somebody else do it two months from now, there'll be qualities that work there in ours, you know. It just yeah. keeps moving, you know. Yeah, yeah. it does. Mm. Beautifully said. It's uh, connected. Yeah. Curly, uh, I can't get Mel to say anything nice about his work. He just says it's <laughs> like everybody else's. <laughs> and I understand that. Uh, a quick, a quick addition. Uh, I just went on Monday to the memorial for our friend Sam Gilliam. Yeah. Uh, and uh, given the generations, you know, people who are in their 80s and so, and then um, a smaller personal celebration for the painter, uh, Bill Hudson, who like me, his origins were uh, in Texas and so. Uh, and, and, you know, now when I think of names and stuff, the list of who uh, I encountered and who I was excited to meet and to know through the years. And I can't call them on the phone anymore because if I get them, I'm not in the place I want to be. <laughs> you know what I mean? But what I'm getting at is uh, their contributions. And we discussed David uh, uh, and that generation. Well, uh, Curly's a printmaker. Bill Hudson's a printmaker. Uh, I just uh, went uh, again in this month to a celebration of Ben Wigfall, the printmaker uh, in upstate New York at SUNY New Paltz. And uh, I had done some work with him. And that reminded me of the uh, printmaker, Bill Majors, 
who, uh, uh, when I first came to New York, I met, he was a guard at the Museum of Modern Art, but he got me my first teaching job at, uh, in the East at uh, Orange County Community College. All of us have intersected and interacted, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, of course, I've printed with Curly. Uh, uh, there's just something uh, that pulls us together and at the same time sends us all back out into the world to uh, uh, relate to other people and they feel uh, connected, you know. Uh, uh, I could go on and on. There's There are phone calls that have been coming this last month from Germany, but they're the son of a uh, uh, important sculptor in, in Zambia named uh, Henry Tayali, who passed some years ago. And this son uh, is now involved in art a bit himself. He's learning, though he's 50 years of age or so. But it's because he saw my name attached to uh, his father. Well, I had dedicated a sculpture uh, by title to his father uh, because I had seen a sculpture at the University of Zambia of a graduate. And this graduate was about 18 feet tall and it was made of cement. And he was in university regalia with, you know, the typical square cornered hat and stuff. But in his hand, instead of a diploma, he had an adz, the traditional adz for digging in the ground or carving. Yeah. And the uh, language related to the sculpture was, if you want to accomplish something, you have to dig for it. And of course, that's ancient knowledge. If it's like, if you want to grow something, you have to plant the seeds. You know, it's that kind of metaphor. Sure. Well, uh, here it is, his son, 50 years after he died, the father, uh, and the son is serious now about trying to be creative himself, you know, and you never know where your legacy, or if not legacy, the thoughts and the activities that you were involved in were meaningful. Well, when I saw that sculpture at the University of uh, Zambia, it's not the kind of work stylistically I would have been associated with, but the metaphor, the meaning there, that was incredible for me, you know, you know, and that's what we all have had to do in order. And I would say even George, for your creation of the Institute, you know, you know, it's something that has to be cultivated, you know, in order for the positive results. Curly's activities at Lancaster, you, you know, just, uh, uh, not, it's not Eastern, sorry, Curly. I've got my right. Pennsylvania towns mixed up, you know, but um, it just means to me, all of us uh, have aspects that can be connected to somebody else. They're not necessarily perfect connections and even sometimes we misconnect when we're trying to connect. But the main thing is that we're creatively trying to do something, if you will. You know, it's, it's like I remember older people saying to me when I was a kid in Texas, well, boy, you're not doing nothing. You, you got to do something. You can't just sit there. You know, you got to do something. And <laughs> they don't say what. They're not limiting you or saying, if you do this, it's not good. Or if you do that, it's better. They're just saying, you've got to try to do something, you know. And I think that's, uh, that's broad enough that it fits positively all of us. You know? And that connects also to David Driscoll's vision for mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the Driscoll Center. He used to talk about the mission being uh, this, this idea of replenishing the field. Mm -hmm. And I, I suggested to him that it wasn't about replenishing the field, it was about expanding the field. If you expand it, it will take care of the replenishing itself. So that <laughs> in that mission statement now, it says expanding the field and mm -hmm. broadening the field, that that is, and, I, and, and it's connected to what you're talking about. The legacy exists 
because you give opportunities to others to sit at the table and be a part of it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, well, Curly, uh, David did accede to your uh, suggestion there. At least he negotiated a settlement. He'd say to me all the time, grow the field. So that, that yeah, includes grow the field. Yeah. Grow the field, you gotta grow the field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And you do that yeah. by, opening, by opening up your arms to others. And Precisely, and, and embracing the gift. Absolutely, Absolutely. right. Absolutely. Uh, Mel, listening to you, I, I think you you make me think that uh, at a certain in a certain way, all meaningful art, all historically significant art, and that's not to say that it's significant because a curator says that it is, but because it's going to be or it, it is or it's becoming such mm -hmm. fifty years hence, whatever the case may be, and whether it's whether it's you know narrative or jazz or classical composition or painting or whatever, that at a certain level, it becomes absolutely poetic, mm. which is to say that it, it, it actually speaks across disciplines. Oh yeah. Whether it's electronic engineering, you know, Art Tatum, mm -hmm. architecture, whatever, it speaks across uh, disciplines and joins in on a harmonic expression of the human spirit in search of emancipation from this place of the absolute uh, gift of human beingness, right? That it recognizes yeah. that gift of human beingness that you always speak about in one way or another, Curly and, and, and Mel. Uh, I know Curly, you are a great poet. You don't talk about that very much. I've read your poetry. It's, it's uh, just, just an amazing expression of the human spirit. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you decided on Mel Edwards mm. to design this uh, David Driscoll Memorial, because of course, David also was a great poet in, a, in another way. He, he didn't read, write much poetry, but certainly all of his work expressed that, that heightened expression of the human spirit that, that, that comes forward in all great art and in all great literature and all great architecture and all great electrical en engineering for that matter or you know, quantum mechanics as, as Curly was, as Mel was alluding to earlier. Maybe you could say something about how, how was it that you came to Mel to this is uh, really give us this monument? Because it's really at the foundation of my work and I know it was connected to David's. David was very much a romantic artist, very romantic in his work. But there was also a lament. And I think of my work as having a, a, a sort of profound lament, a crying out, a calling out are reaching out to others, wanting to extend through that visual language, through that creative expression, a hand to touch another hand. It's a, as I mentioned, a lament. Well, David was very much about reaching out through his artwork. It was very affectionate, as I mentioned, very romantic, very redemptive. Well, Mel's work is that also. The only difference with Mel's work is if you bump into it, you might get injured because it's so... <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> <laughs> but it is, you know, I've seen, you know, we have a, there's a piece at Lafayette College that Mel was commissioned to do called Transcendence. And this is honor of David K. McDonough. David K. McDonough was one of the first African uh, American slaves to actually go to college and, and receive a, a, a college degree. And I think it was in 1859 that he got his degree. And the 49. First, 49, eyes, yeah. ears, nose, and throat doctor, African American mm -hmm. eyes, ears, and throat doctor. Well, Mel's piece was an honor of, of David K. McDonough, but the piece, people coming around, students standing next to it, they take photographs with it. The piece is not just monumental, but it creates a space, mm -hmm. a space where one can embrace their past and their history and give permission. So I think David did that. I try to do that in my my own work, uh, as, I, as you mentioned, the poetry and also the 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 prints and the, the paintings is about a certain kind of crying out or calling out, a call and response, if you will. <laughs> and uh, that can be very poetic. It can be uh, full of song. I, uh, the, most of the musicians I like uh, are engaged in that, whether that's Luther Vandross or uh, Frankie Beverly and Mays, the songs are about a desire, a reaching mm -hmm. out. And they want that desire to be met and they want that call to be heard. They want that lament to be uh, engaged. So that is to me a human expression, a human desire. 
And so the, my, my writing comes from that same place. My work comes from that same place. Uh, my being is about that. And I think David Driscoll's being was about that as well, to create something that didn't exist previously, to make it known, to make it present. Yeah. The great artist Al Loving said that to me once. He said, artists create things that don't exist because they want them to be present. Mm -hmm. They want the argument to be present. They want the principle to be present. They want the song to be present. You know, uh, uh, currently in relation to that sculpture at uh, Lafayette, uh, dedicated to David McDonald, and of course, because of that involvement, I got a lot of information <clears throat> on his life. And, um, you know, and I gathered, uh, he was the plantation product of the yes. McDonald family and their interest as they were in Louisiana and Mississippi. Mm -hmm. However, um, in that era, the 1800s, um, and even a century before, commerce and everything else flowed by ship so that Baltimore, Charleston, Mobile, New Orleans, Galveston, that was the, the route, the, the, the passageway on the continent, you know, and connections to uh, Africa and South America and uh, the Caribbean. Well, uh, in being here in Baltimore, uh, I found where the, the McDonald family's holdings are here. Yes. And uh, there's a, uh, uh, commercial development, McDonald Road. One a section of McDonald Road goes across one of the uh, freeways that I cross uh, or use often. And one day I decided to follow the primary road that had the name. And uh, all of a sudden, here's a large farm area still owned by, I presume, the McDonald family or interest, uh, but it's a school. You know, it's, uh, high school or you know something like that, but private, and um, and there was plowing going on in the field. You know, it wasn't cotton, I don't think. <laughs> you know, and I always like to use cotton as the big metaphor for our history, though everything we know was planted and grown. But uh, I stopped across the street because there was a farm stand of fresh vegetables that had grown grown there. And there was a house that looked like it might have been from the late uh, 1800s or something like that. And I asked the people who were selling the vegetables, you know, if they had anything to do with McDonald or the family. Or, they didn't know anything about the history or any of that. And of course, I didn't tell them about my work or my interest. You know, I just looked and observed and I said, you know, I could, in my mind, in my imagination, this great profit-making enterprise of this family, which was intercoastal in the United States and ultimately went uh, east across the ocean to Liberia. So there's a town in Liberia named Baltimore. You know, I mean, <laughs> there are all kinds of connections that you find. And then I, in uh, uh, following up the information I was getting from the project, uh, well, uh, evidently the McDonald's were active with the Presbyterians. Well, it happened that in my family, I grew up in a Presbyterian family uh, church household, you know, and so I knew something about them. And I, you know, uh, uh, not in a judgmental way, but um, I began to understand that these uh, religious organizations were corporate as well. And they always are, and actually always have been. You know, they they don't they never miss a, miss a collection serving as we do. You know, anybody who's going to church. But what I'm getting at is these interrelated contacts of peoples uh, bring information. And while I'm a sculptor, I'm naturally involved in uh, aesthetic discoveries and revelations you find them through all kinds of things that you didn't expect 
necessarily that to be the, the topic or the information that's shared. And when I was in South Africa, you know, I stood with my stepson at the place called uh, Cape Point, which is as far south as you can go uh, in Africa. And I said to myself, well, we've been in uh, Egypt and Morocco. We've been as far north as you can go in Africa. I've, I've been to uh, uh, Nairobi on, on the uh, uh, east and Dakar and the, the, the cities along the west and Gulf Coast of Africa. And I've had the same experience in the United States. I was born in the Gulf of Mexico, lived and was educated on the Pacific coast and have lived on the Atlantic coast for, you know, and you realize uh, it's quite possible just in doing what you're trying to do that you get to know this planet that we're on, these people in the world that we all live with, and these multiple, multiple, multiple aesthetic systems that human beings keep inventing and reinventing. And at the same time, somehow we still keep communicating. You know, we do keep, uh, if you will, communicating uh, if you, poetically as you refer to uh, Curly, you know that, well, it's all poetic. It's, it's, it's all a beautiful experience, sometimes Absolutely. difficult, sometimes easy, sometimes fun, you know. And as me and my little eight, nine-year-old buddies used to say when I lived in Dayton, Ohio, we go down to this natural sand pile, which nowhere near any ocean or water or anything. But if you dug in the dirt there, there's a big pile of sand. That must be geology. I don't know what it was, but we, we would get together on uh, summer uh, mornings, we said, okay, let's meet down at the sand pile. We're gonna sit down there and tell some lies, <laughs> meaning we were gonna talk and tell stories. Yeah. And if you take the word lies and translate it to the word fiction, then you know what, that would, makes it nicer. But we love to say lies, you tell lies, you use your imagination. And people, we just made each other laugh for you know the whole morning till it was time to go home. You know? Yeah, and I think that's about creativity. You just keep doing it and using your imagination. You keep pulling up things that you know and things that you don't know. You know, yeah, and it, it gives you something, but it gives other people thoughts. You may introduce a thought for one reason, but where somebody else's. Uh, reception of it takes it somewhere else and that's a spreading of the uh of the good news if you will <laughs> you know mel that power of that sculpture also brings the story of david k madonna forward from the shadows of history oh yeah it makes that permanent it makes the story monumental and inspiring so art can can be redemptive as i explained not just redemptive for the maker but redemptive for the community that uh oh yeah that encounters the work as well. Oh, absolutely, you know, and uh, any number of things that have, uh, there's a form that I use, uh, uh, sort of pulled out of one of my earlier pieces and I use it independently and it's called column of memory or chain columns, uh, that, that vertical, uh, but, but uh, people presume chains out of slavery again, come on, you know. I said, well, no, you've got to look into the, the meaning of the word chain. You've got to look into the functional use of chains. Why were they invented? Chains existed way before slavery, you know, and certainly the, uh, uh, you know, post-1500 uh, international slave trade from Africa. It's way before that, you know. And all over the world, uh, blacksmiths who made chains well, the, the uh, real question was, was it strong enough to do its job? It, it was an improvement on twine or rope for securing things and being flexible. And a chain is as strong as its weakest link. You know, that's a metaphor, but it's also a truth. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's a metaphor for being connected, that one generation is linked to another, 
that uh, one group of people are connected to others and their own, you know, um, it's just a matter of the relativity that one uses to approach the language or the relativity that one's use, one uses to create form, you know, and, and, and so it's what you do with it, you know, that's really what it amounts to. And, and what you haven't done is still there to be developed, potentially. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Thank this, you, Mel. Yeah. And, uh, did I interrupt you, Mel? Were you just, did you no, want to? Anytime you say something, you interrupt me because uh, <laughs> I might say something. Another I come to you with, a, with an apology yeah, in hand. Please interrupt me. <laughs> please interrupt me, uh, George, because uh, uh, I think this is a great uh, exchange, you know, you know uh, and every time Curly and I get to talk, George, we, uh, I haven't had a chance to talk that much with you, but Curly and I have uh, thrown more than a few words together. And each time we finish, we know we could have talked longer, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, well, my wife uh, will ask me to call you to get a piece of information Mel, and I'll give you a call and we'll talk for two or three hours telling stories. And then I'll, my wife will say, well, did you find out? I'll say, oh, yeah, I forgot all about that. <laughs> uh, but you know, uh, Curly, what you were saying about the way um, certain kinds of art, and certainly this you were referring to, to Melanie's poetic terms, creates a space uh, within which um, unanticipated miracles can unfold, one of which is coming into the place of oneself, I think. And I, and for some reason, you you got me to think about Mel's work and language in terms that I had thought of, you know, metaphorically perhaps, but not with words. And that is the striking, um, forgive me for using this big word, but juxtaposition between the materials, the discarded industrial, uh, materials, the you know the the metal, which you think of as noisy and violent, and and uh, you know forcing uh, uh, one object to become something else, or one material into some other productive form. Uh, but when you get close to that to that sculpture, uh, you find yourself in a space that is actually quiet, even silent and gentle. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to say about that, Curly. I, I know that Mel won't <laughs> he does something. He tell you, no, you're wrong. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah. what have you got to say about that, Curly? I think you're right about that. It, it, it repurposes material in a different kind of way, you know, especially with Mel's stainless steel objects. But you're right, it's monumental, it's imposing, and then it's quiet. We're actually building a plaza in front of the Driscoll Center uh, for the installation of the sculpture. So the, the university got inspired by this and said, we want to build a plaza and make it so people will come and be able to be around the sculpture. So it creates this quiet space. I think you're absolutely right. It's yeah. such large and monumental work, but it gives you permission to reflect. And all, the, also the material itself is reflective of light yeah. and, yeah. and the way males uh, masterful use of space and shape and form is really amazing. But it also talks about repurposing material and representing material that is normally used for other kind of reasons. Right. And it just connects also to the art of Africa. A lot right. of the art made in Africa now is, is repurposing material that is indigenous to Africa or rooted in Africa or found in Africa, recontextualized to turn into objects that are sculptures or wall pieces. Uh, uh, you know, this is very popular and this idea of redeeming material that is thrown away. And that also connects to the experience of African-Americans, that material that had been thrown away is then repurposed and, and, and infused with a different kind of spirit. And I think male sculpture has done that as well. It uh, references something very historical, something monumental, but at the same time, it gives refuge and space so that you can reflect on it and you can... Uh, uh, come together around it. So it gives permission. So I think you're right about that. Yeah. Uh, a number of those things. A, a, a quick one in relation to that, Curly. Um, nobody would think 
that uh, say, as, uh, I don't think anyway, uh, that an, this kind of sculptor I, may, I am and stuff, you know, in the ways you've described it. And I can say that probably the earliest influence, I get, and influence may not be the right word, but recognition of form and shape and reuse of materials comes from watching my mother or my grandmother make biscuits in the old days. Because yeah, yeah. they make the, you know, the dough and stuff and roll it out and it's uh, flat and it's laid out. And then you take a drinking water glass or cup and they cut, uh, press it onto the dough and cut out the, the form of the biscuit. Well, you get the biscuit form, but you get all of the dough that's left around the cut. And of course, they don't throw it away. They just roll it back up and repurpose it. And it's more, more dough and it gets through the process and there's not a scrap of it left and it all gets baked. And you say, well, <coughs> excuse me, uh, being um, trained in the art world, you know, art school and all, all of that kind of thing and learning and then going to the scrapyard and buying cutouts, you know, in other words, the, the biscuit parts taken out and the, the shape is there in the steel, they're circles or triangles or whatever. And they just become shapes and forms to work with, you know. But conceptually, the main thing is that, you know, no, it still is material for eternity. It's just a matter of, it may change its function, it may change its um, uh, place in our knowledge bank. Uh, and then it goes where we choose to repurpose it or use it, you know. And of course, all over the world, whether people are making beautiful things uh, or making war, materials are never finished with. They're dug up and repurposed. You know, they're always used. And that's both negative and positive. It's incredible how human beings have the capacity to uh, recognize that something in the form that you find it has other purposes or possibilities and that's true in art because art, what's true in art is just the reality of what's true in life. You know, it doesn't, uh, we give it that three letter word art and, and therefore put it on a bit of a pedestal. But the truth is uh, the ways of making art are the ways of making life. You know, that just is perennial and we didn't start it and we won't stop it, you know, and hopefully uh, we can do something to assist the positive part of it. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mel. Uh, you know, we, uh, we've got great storytellers here, two great poets, uh, Curly and, and Mel. So of course we're already uh, running over time and we haven't even had a chance for any questions. Uh, Angela Lynn, do you have any questions posted? Um, there are not any questions in the Q&A box yet, um, but if people would like to start. Yeah, I, I know that Curly is pressed for time. Uh, so maybe I, I would ask you one question, Curly, and then I, I know you've got to see to other obligations. Uh, Curly, maybe you could say something about um, your own life mm. as it, as it uh, brings you here today in this conversation, which is to me incredibly special to have you two people here to swap ideas and, and uh, talk about not just the past, but also the present and the future in the incredibly poetic terms that you're able to articulate. Can you say a little bit of something about how your life, you know, how you grew up and how you uh, got from the sand pit to the to the Driscoll Center directorship. <laughs> sure, a lot of it was by accident. I often describe. Tell me myself. about your lies. <laughs> yeah, as a as a as a Ben Errol, in that uh, it took me a long time to make this kind of choice. I had uh, 
grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, went to school, got drafted into the military during the end of Vietnam, came out, went to night school with a family for 10 years to get my first degree and, and made those kind of choices, began to practice as an artist. And I wrote a letter to a very famous artist, Mel, I appreciate this. I wrote a letter to Elizabeth Catlett in mm -hmm. Guanabaca, Mexico. And I asked Elizabeth Catlett, could I come and study with her? And I said, I'll do anything. I'll mop your floors, clean the studio, rub your back, anything I can, <laughs> get into that chain that Mel was talking about. Yeah, yeah. And I never heard anything back. And then one morning I get a call from Robert Blackburn out of New York City. And he says, I understand you're going to see Elizabeth Catlett. I says, I don't know what you're talking about. I says, I wrote to her, she never replied. He said, well, call her right now. I says, call her Elizabeth Catlett right now on the phone? He said, yes. So I called her and she says, you know, Bob has it all wrong. I called him and told him to give you a fellowship because she had had back surgery and couldn't host any, uh, any kind of intern or fellow. And that's how I got to Bob Blackburn's in New, in New York yeah. City. And I traveled from Cleveland, Ohio, at tr on a train on Thursday nights at 12 o'clock, got into Grand Central Station in the morning, stayed for three days, and then went back to Cleveland because of my family. I did that for two years, going back and forth to New York City. So that was that one phone call from Bob Blackburn. Yeah. The second phone call that changed my life happened at Bob Blackburn's. It was a phone call that he received from Robert Madison at Lafayette College, the chair of the art history department. And he said, I was told to call you by the artist Grace Hardigan and they called Bob Blackburn because they were looking for an African-American artist that also had lectured in art history. And I had did both and I had some things published as well. So Bob Blackburn brought me that phone and says, answer this call curly before I tell anybody else in the workshop about this. <laughs> <laughs> and I got that interview. <laughs> that was the second phone call that changed my life. Yeah. And of course, the third one was I, uh, David Driscoll. I was at Lafayette College, and David Driscoll uh, came as a guest artist to do a lecture to the art history class. And I was teaching African American art history as well as teaching printmaking. And we met him to bring him into the class, and I was so excited. I was teaching his text in my class, and all my students were very excited. David Driscoll, this book, you know, we we're learning from this book. And the author's walking into the room to lecture. And he lectured, it was a wonderful talk. And at the end of it, we had a dinner and he said he had one request. He said he wanted, he knew that Mel Edwards and William T. Williams and Faith Ringel had worked with me at EPI, the workshop. And he says, can he work with me also? So this is, <laughs> he said, I wanna be with the rest of them. I wanna go with Mel and, and William T. and all the rest. So that's how I started working with David. And as a result, uh, he became not only a mentor, but a friend. And we, I did his first international exhibition I organized in Mexico. We traveled to Costa Rica. We traveled to Tokyo together. I mean, I did a lot of work with him and it was a very special moment. So the way in which I came to the Driscoll Center, I was on the board of the Driscoll Center. They had a failed search and the former director pleaded with me to consider being the interim director for just one year while they remounted the search. That was very deceptive of Bob Steele who did this to me. I knew so Bob. I agree. I agree. And that turned into 12 years now. This is that. Yeah, yeah. So, well, 10 years now. But I was a chairman of the art history, uh, chairman of the art department at Lafayette College. I was running Experimental Printmaking Institute and coming back and forth to the Driscoll Center. I had yeah. those positions and it was quite a challenge. But I did that because I had such uh, respect and uh, uh, love for David. But it's an interesting discovery. At first, I was a little uneasy about it. I had, you know, raised money to support my own institution, uh, the Experimental Printmaking Institute. But these were different challenges. This was a larger responsibility, more staff, more fundraising, as you, as you can imagine. I was a little intimidated by that because Bob Steele was a very effective fundraiser. We used to call him the rainmaker because he really knew how to do this. But I realized something later on after a few years that I was probably the perfect person for the position because I had not only uh, practiced as an artist, I had taught African and African-American art history. I had a relationship with David so I could actually speak about the center with such uh, a certain kind of authority and a certain kind of authenticity that had not been present before. So I think that was, that was sort of meant to be. 
And uh, so now I'm coming to the conclusion of that. I'll be departing the Driscoll Center uh, June of 2023, the new successor has been appointed and is coming in. And I did things a little different, George. She's been working with me for the last year. When I came in, I walked into Bob Steele's office and he walked right out. So <laughs> this is a little different this time. <laughs> but uh, the, the goal was to, to make the center more responsive to the community to bring a different kind of dynamic to the scholarship, especially with the philosophy and the archives and the collections. We've expanded on the space, the collections. We're becoming a, a preferred location for the collections of uh, African-American artists from around the country. So in many ways, uh, I, I brought something to the center that I think was valuable, but it's time for it to become even more. And we consider ourselves a research institute that has a phenomenal collection, both our collection and archives. And uh, I think we're one of the three top research and study institutes in the country for African-American art. Yeah, yeah. I don't doubt that in the least. But thanks so much for saying all of that, Curly. I, I'm just imagining the uh, younger people in our audience that, that uh, need to hear what you and Mel are saying in terms of how it's so important to not only be open to the miracle of those three telephone calls, but in fact, to initiate the miracle with the letter that you wrote out of the blue in the first place. Uh, you have to take and action. It, and, you, and you know that's a miracle because you, you, I'm sure you said to yourself, she'll never answer them. No, but she did. Right? Uh, and, and yet, of course, you're sitting there today because you took that step and, and, and you know, Mel, uh, thinking of you in those terms, uh, it's, just natural for you to think that you're, you're watching your, your mother and your grandmother make biscuits and that they're using a cup as opposed to something that's been, you know, manufactured to cut the things out, but they're use, repurposing something else to actually cut the form of those biscuits and, and then reusing the, you know, the, the, uh, the leftovers to make more biscuits. You know, millions of kids see that. Sure. But once in a while, a miracle comes along. It's kind of called a young artist that's in the kitchen with that mother and that grandmother that sees something that will inform the rest of their lives, just like that, just like that letter did. And it comes from an accident that brings together the, 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 the seeds of a miracle, the soil and the seeds of a miracle, and then gives us what we have today, which is Mel Edwards and, and Curly Holton. Absolutely. It's what you do with those accidents, George. Exactly right. I, I know you've got to jump. I'm going to stick here with 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 Mel for another minute or so. But of course, as Mel said, we didn't, you know, we didn't say it all. That's for sure. Appreciate the dialogue. As it as Mel had said, this is a wonderful exchange, and I hope it continues. Best oh, wishes to everyone. Well, as all a matter right. of fact, I think we have an appointment. Of course, I don't remember the date, but yes. you'll remind soon, me. Soon come. You'll remind me. As they say in Jamaica, <laughs> soon come. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks so yeah. much. Sure. Thanks, thank Curly. So Talk please, to you soon. Yeah. Yeah. Greetings yeah. to the family. All right. Thank you. And, and, and Mel, uh, you know, needless to say, it's um, an amazing grace to be in your presence, knowing that there are young people listening to what you have to say and uh, knowing that, in fact, just in speaking, you're growing the field in ways that, that uh, very few people in the world could today. Uh, I wonder if you could say another word or two, at least, about the projects that you have underway now. You've obviously got the Driscoll Monument uh, on the board, but what else have you got going on? Mm -hmm. Well, the um, I guess I'll go with the largest one, which is for um, uh, the Crenshaw District in Los Angeles. Uh, it's, of course, on the West Coast. And uh, I'm here in the East Coast, we are actually fabricating, in fact, the fabrication is basically completed uh, uh, at uh, the ARJ Fabrication Company in uh, Trenton, New Jersey, who I've worked with for over uh, 25 years on larger scale work. Uh, and uh, they're very good to work with and handle the work well. But the project is for Crenshaw Boulevard in Los Angeles, in the western part of the city. Uh, uh, there's a rail line that's been extended from the airport into uh, that part of uh, the western part of Los Angeles. Um, um, and 
the rail line that they're extending intersects with another rail line that goes to the center of the city. But this Crenshaw district is historically significant uh, for uh, earlier on Japanese Americans and very much so uh, since uh, the, the 40s and 50s African Americans. And um, it's a community uh, on the edge of it is actually where I had my first studio. Oh. And so uh, they weren't aware of that, but uh, I was in a building owned by an Afro-American ceramics person of the generation or so older than me named Tony Hill. He had a commercial ceramics uh, enterprise on uh, um, Jefferson Boulevard and I worked for him. And then he had a building on the corner of Vernon and Van Ness, which the California Eagle newspaper was in. It's a very important historic uh, African-American newspaper. And then one of the storefronts in there, he rented to me very economically. And in that garage out back of it is where I made my very first welded steel sculpture. Uh, and this is probably only a dozen blocks from where the, the, the piece of mine that's going to be 35 feet high, uh, links of chain as far as identifiable form, uh, and stainless steel. So it will be uh, quite an eye catcher uh, just because of its scale and dynamics. But for me, it's symbolic. Uh, members of my family have lived in that uh, area in Los Angeles through the years. And I first saw the street in 1951 when it was really not even, not significantly African-American and full of new automobile showrooms, which disappeared years ago. But what I'm getting at is um, sometimes where your work goes when it's public work has implications beyond what you realize when you start, yeah. you know? And I think that's the, the pleasure of public art is where you start with it and where it goes in the lives of human beings is very important. And you could say if, if the saying, go west, young man, go west. Well, that's as far as you can go until you get into the water, you know? And uh, I'm happy about that with my sculpture. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I have a, uh, a message here from Johan Tan, and then I'll uh, pose a question for you, Mel. I'm going to have to jump for a second. I'll come right back. Uh, Johan Tan says, uh, I just want to say thank you very much to everyone for this wonderful talk from the School of the Arts at the University of Pretoria. We are incredibly thankful uh, for your time and efforts and to the speakers specifically for sharing your wisdom so generously with us. Kind regards, Johan Tan. And uh, a question, Mel, if we can, if you have time for at least one. Um, oh, that, that actually, uh, let me just see if I can find the question. Um, uh, George, yes. I, I, have, I have a question uh, in the chat box. Okay, great. If you could ask that, I'll be right back with you. Go right ahead, uh, Simona, thank you. Uh, I wonder if you can read it because it's noisy here. Oh, okay. Of course. Uh, maybe, maybe, um, uh, maybe Angela Lynn can take over. I'll be right back. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, this question is from Simonetta. As you work on the David Driscoll Memorial, what are your guiding principles in terms of memorializing and monumentalizing a figure of such significance in the arts and African culture? And how does that play with your approach Amer to culture? American American culture? I'm sorry. American. Oh, sorry. Arts and American culture. How does that play with your approach to sculpture more generally? Um, that's almost too abstract a kind of question. Uh, it's way too broad. Uh, I mean, it's a good question, but what I mean by that is I don't work generally one idea to illustrate uh, another idea. The work tends to uh, inform, if you have to use words to describe aspects um, or, or qualities, the language is apt to be poetic or, uh, you know, because otherwise I give you a simplistic, I don't know, 
you know, in, in terms of the way the question is phrased, there are no individual forms uh, uh, that say this represents David in any more than it does any other human being because it's not a figurative work. And what I find, uh, you know, and uh, this is maybe to play more with your question, to play with it than to answer it. And people often ask of works that are abstract and symbolic, they want something that gives them a figurative, realistic answer. And that's just not logical. Uh, uh, so I would say that, well, for instance, I think I, I described a, a, a moment or two ago the column in uh, uh, Los Angeles in the Crenshaw district. I made a smaller uh, uh, variant of that idea about uh, 15, 20 years ago in Dakar, Senegal. Nobody commissioned it. I just uh, decided I wanted to make a variant of these, this column of memory concept. And I um, went to a steel uh, worker fabricator who had been allowing me to come and uh, work directly on small things in his workshop. And with his uh, cooperation, I made this uh, about 13 or 14 foot high variant of one of the chain columns. And then um, uh, in my own family, personal uh, um, intentions, I had built a house uh, in the outskirts of Dakar in a, a place uh, called Deni Melik Gay, where people were village farmers. I had, uh, with the artist Suleiman Keita, uh, I had uh, gotten six or seven hectares of land and I built a small house uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and then had a little workspace outside of it. Uh, uh, and I celebrated the house and I installed the sculpture outside and between the sculpture was standing with, uh, the house at w one point, the sculpture, and then about a uh, hundred yards further out in the field was this very large baobab tree, which was probably 200 years old. And uh, my personal emotional or uh, reasoning and thought was that, well, in my family, we'd been away 200 years and uh, I had gone home to Africa, uh, built a, 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 a house, a dwelling, planted seeds and grew peanuts. And at the same time, um, built a, a sculpture that was between the house and the, the big baobab. Um, and we celebrated. And it was uh, me and uh, artists and friends there in Senegal. Well, about two years later, the government wanted the land my house was on. And they were building and commemorating a uh, historical school that had been used in the period of colonialism that uh, people like uh, Senghor and stuff had gone to. Well, now they wanted this land so they could expand and more memorialize it. They knew nothing of my private uh, 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 work in relation to me and my family and our history and our emotions. But anyway, uh, my friend Suleiman Keita said, look, we just have to sell the land or they'll just take it. So I got enough money out of it to buy a, a very used old Peugeot station wagon, which <laughs> get me around. But what I'm getting at, I then took the sculpture and eventually I, I uh, donated it to the city of San Luis in the north of uh, Senegal, uh, which is right on the uh, edge of the water and the lagoon and where the Senegal River goes into the Atlantic Ocean. If you will, metaphorically and possibly actually, uh, it was the last spot in Africa that somebody coming in the slave trade would have seen of Africa before they ended in the Americas. 
that piece is there at the uh, Comtoise de la Fleuve in uh, uh, Saint Louis. And in relation to that, the city of Saint Louis uh, made me an honorary citizen of Senegal. Uh, now, uh, I haven't worked out absolutely in advance the meanings of the uh, work that I'm doing for David. I've made several variations uh, experimentally. And uh, I don't uh, try to develop the ideas in advance to predict what I will put or what will develop into the sculpture. So you could say like improvising and developing a musical composition. I'm still uh, uh, playing with the ideas of the forms and the shapes as a, a, a pianist would compose by playing with the possibility of those 88 keys on the piano and the multiple combinations possible, you know? So, but that, uh, I've always avoided the kind of narrowness that your question asks, you know? Maybe I'm just ducking being and being irresponsible, but I've found that, no, it, it allows me more freedom in the work. Thank you, Mel. Which, which, which by the way, David would have said, well, that's okay. It, he, because the reason I can say that is uh, he did come to the inauguration of the piece at uh, uh, Curley's uh, college and at Curley, and uh, complimented it very much. So he, he'll be okay with what I did, you know. I, I, I don't doubt that. No, we have maybe just one more question, Mel. We've, we've taken up more of your time than we've uh, certainly deserved. Uh, but we have a question from uh, Tina W. Muoto. Uh, can you speak? Yes, 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 I can speak. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, um, my name is Chine Do Muoto. I am originally from um, Nigeria, Lagos, I am Igbo, and I'm calling in now from Dublin, Ireland. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question kind of like big, begins with a preface and then goes into the question, but very short of, I really resonated what you said around found objects because in entering into sculpture and in making items, it has been from this point of deprivation in which I have gravitated towards found objects and particularly metal. And also, I'm trying to link that into, for example, the Haitian Revolution and the role that blacksmiths played. And I think my question that I want to ask you as, as a sculptor and as a man that has been in this quote-unquote game for so long, what is the future that you hope to see primarily for African artists um, working in the medium of sculpture? And especially when you mentioned that whole role of the role of public art and the impact that it has on people's lives as it moves? Well, there are already, uh, since independence in, in Nigeria, um, and I'll uh, focus uh, Nigeria uh, just because I uh, have been there many times and um, uh, it's a very important place to me personally. Um, um, Benin uh, and uh, um, uh, the Oba of Benin, the present Oba, was a graduate student at Rutgers University in the 1980s, uh, working, I believe, in public administration and stuff. And of course, he's since uh, been a diplomat. And for the last seven years or so, the new Oba of Benin. And I've been going to Benin since 1971. And um, very familiar with the bronze casters, the families of Chief Omoregbe Ine and uh, his uh, son, Daniel Ine. And they keep me apprised of what's going on in uh, uh, Nigeria. But also the, the contemporary artists in Nigeria have been important to me. And I'm saying it this way because you, if you're from Nigeria, if you're Igbo, there are already uh, concepts and structures, historic and modern, that uh, you already have uh, 
access to. And wherever you are and whatever you're trying to do, you simply have to use your own imagination and learn the appropriate technology for what your imagination says to you, you should try to learn and develop. Because um, uh, no other person can really tell a person where or what direction they should go with their work. I would say inquire and um, uh, be knowledgeable and, uh, uh, and interested in seeing things and from everywhere, you know. Um, um, uh, uh, if you're in Ireland, they have smithing traditions. No, they're not African traditions, but look, uh, iron is iron, heat is heat, and hammers are hammers, and uh, they can be manual or electric. There can be electric saws or files, or there can be, you know, in other words, the tools and the main tool, which is your imagination and personal uh, commitment to uh, trying to do something, trying to see what you will come up with, what you will event, uh, invent yourself. Um, uh, the um, Nigerian creative person I'm most close to is Demas Nwoko, who's from the village Idumuje Boko, but uh, he's done many important things. Google him up and uh, you will uh, uh, find you have a most profound person uh, for the 20th and 21st century in terms of art and uh, society. Um, as far as, uh, you know, you're uh, alive, uh, a, a younger man um, uh, who has the possibility of finding things, my generation won't have that opportunity, you know. And you just, uh, I'll, I'll be frank with you, the question you're asking me is really your job, <laughs> not mine. Uh, because I started this job uh, over 60 years ago, and um, there's enough documentation on it, uh, you know, by Googling and books and this and that. Uh, but on the other hand, I'll say this, I'm confident you and your generation will do well, you know, that you'll find your way, you know. And uh, uh, I'm just happy uh, for myself that I've gotten to know artists on every continent on the world. And everybody has done something, is doing something, and will do something. Now, whether they make the, the pages of this or that uh, art magazine or this or that art book or that kind of thing, that's almost immaterial. I don't mean that I'm discounting uh, those, the media, but I mean, the main thing is, okay, do the work and you will make the discovery. Try to discover and you will make the work. They go together and uh, the combination uh, will uh, create a positive future for you and, uh, and your work, you know. And I'm sorry, I don't know the uh, uh, Igbo words for uh, just keep up the good work, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you come from a, a very broad dynamic culture already and you've lived internationally, so you had a view of the world. Well, that's the same as me coming from uh, the Gulf Coast of Texas, uh, the Piney Woods of Texas, uh, and uh, sitting and drinking palm wine uh, in Ibada, you know, or if, if you're from Lagos, uh, uh, you know. Uh, well, anyway, you know what I'm talking about, but uh, I don't know if you ever read the writer uh, J.P. Clark or... Um, uh, Chinua Chebi, I just assume that you have. <laughs> I've read Chinua, I've read Chinua, but never J.P. Clark. Well, uh, I, I knew both of them. There's a picture of me and J.P. in a book, and uh, his widow has a sculpture of mine uh, for them. And uh, Chinua was given one of my small sculptures at an award 
uh, uh, years ago in New York at uh, City College, and I got to know him. And uh, uh, I mean, they're, they're a part of my generation or just a little senior to me, but uh, the creative uh, uh, struggle, there was Ben Osawe, who was a carver, a sculptor from uh, Benin and uh, uh, what is it, and Ben Wongwu. Uh, any number of Nigerian sculptors uh, and uh, painters who, as I first encountered Nigeria in the 1970s, uh, who then, uh, you're now living with their contributions as the next generation will live with your, your contribution. Thank you so much. Could I just finally ask you to spell the demos? We're going to have to shut it there. I'm sorry. Uh, we're. Uh, I've just got a notice that we're running short on time. So thank you, uh, Chinnam, uh, no for that question. Really nicely done. And do forgive me for interjecting. Uh, Mel, let me just say to you, uh, endless thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. You are a uh, an honorary citizen to many uh, cities, a, uh, a citizen of many nations, and a poet to the world. Uh, you are just a blessed human being, and we are so grateful to you that you share some of your time and shed some of your light today. I feel much warmer now than we did uh, than I did when we started. Uh, I will uh, give you a call tomorrow to thank you uh, more profusely, but for now, I see from our host that we have to wrap up. We've run over time here. Uh, but do thank you. Thank you so much for uh, thank you inviting too. me to be with you. Yeah. Blessings upon all of us. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Simonetta. <laughs>